So Jim Duxbury, you're first off. Wow, first one. Um, awesome. <clears throat> these are precision cubes. They're cut exactly, exactly the same on all sides. And then I have to draw it. I draw the sphere that's cut into it. Um, when two spheres intersect each other, no matter what size they are, it's a perfect circle of intersection. <clears throat> and if these aren't perfectly, the sphere isn't perfectly turned on the, each side, one of the side holes would be bigger than the other one. So it's just a precision turning, a lot of fun to make. Very nice. I did an article on illusions. Um, this is turned from both sides. You turn a design on one side and then you turn the same design on the other side halfway through the piece. And by offsetting it, half the dimension of the inner circle, the bar from the circle on the other side goes right through the middle. So this first one, the round one over here you can't see my mouse, can you? No, you don't see no. that. Um, the round one is actually made round and then cut in half. And and when you and take a probably about an eighth of an inch out of both sides and put it back together so it ends up elliptical. The other one is turned and cut diagonally on a rectangular piece, turned around and glued back together. So it makes an S-shaped piece. So just fun to do. Very nice. Makes you think. In these days, you need something to think about. Oh. Uh. About how big are those? Oh, the rectangular ones probably about uh, inch and three quarters by three and a half or something. I can make them bigger, but uh, it's kind of precision. You have to cut right through the center <clears throat> at a 45, I think it is, a 45 degree angle. And when you take, if you took that piece and turned it around the other way, it would make a perfect, that would be a perfect circle in the middle of that rectangle. No. Jim, have you, have, Jim, have you looked at the uh, Hans Weisflug stuff, the German guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I made one of his bowls. Um, they're probably the hardest thing I've ever made. But, uh, and then I made another one that was better than his, and it came apart. There's no wood left to hold it together. <laughs> it was, uh, I could show that if you want to see it, but uh, I don't show that to many people. That was I did all the hard parts. Go ahead. Sorry. Tom? Now this uh, whole kind of, I kind of had a lot of fun with it, but I wish when I, after I had it turned and that, I had looked a little closer when I was gluing it up and up because uh, the grain pattern, if I had uh, rotated it a little bit more, would have been much better results. But it was a lot of fun to turn. That's about it on it. Uh, there's nothing any other special with it. Tom, Tom, what what finish did you use on that? The, 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 uh, I've been I've been using this uh, uh, my Mylans. Uh, I just put a sanding sealer on it and then their uh, friction polish. That's all I use on it. Okay, looks good. I I really like this. Uh, Paducah and I just have a small piece of it. I don't know where I got it from, but I, I really liked when I got the piece all done in that uh, grain pattern. It, it came out really good. It's like it's about four by two. A little piece of walnut knob on top of it. I've been turning a lot of uh, bracelets and uh, I tried doing this with, uh, get this uh, intersecting, like, what do they call it, a Celtic knot or something. And uh, this one came out real good. I tried it with rotating it so that it would go uh, 
the other way also, and like at a 90 degrees. Uh, and I found that right where the intersection is, we made so many cuts in that. I was doing it with the uh, table saw on that. I couldn't get things to line up. Uh, I found it worked a little bit better when I made my cuts on the bandsaw and then just made sure I had a good flat surface when I uh, glued it back together with the veneer in between. Very nice. Mike Nathal, you're on. Okay. Um, this is an unusual wood. I got it from a friend who lives in Medina um, County or whatever county Medina is in. Um, anyways, it's called hop horn bean. It's also known as ironwood. And uh, it's kind of a nifty, uh, nice looking wood. But the interesting thing about it is it's, a, it's a, such a slow growing tree. This, this was a, came from a five inch diameter trunk and it had over a hundred growth rings in it. So that's kind of nifty. It, although it's called iron wood, it's really it wasn't that hard to cut. I mean, it was about the same as any anything I do, maple or cherry or anything like that. So anyways, and this um, was finished with Osmo, Osmo Poly X. It's a new uh, finish I'm experimenting with. I kind of like it. Is that the same that uh, Woodcraft donated for our auction the one year, the big slabs, ironwood? I don't know. Definitely not. I think that was some kind of uh, imported wood. Okay. Yeah. And I don't remember it being called ironwood. It could have been. Well, some were saying they thought it was ironwood, as I remember. Oh, okay. I, I thought a lot of people were saying it was monkey pot. Okay. Mike, is that a matte finish, an Osmo matte finish? Osmo offers two or three different satin and matte, and this one is gloss. The photography doesn't show the gloss, but I um, put the two layers on the two recommended coats, and then I buffed it, um, buffed it with uh, the white diamond wheel. <laughs> this is the second piece I got from uh, the same tree. Um, this was a crotch, so it was a little bit it spread out a little bit. I could get seven inch diameter, but it's not that tall and it's hollow. So this, this is relatively challenging uh, shape because it's so uh, small entry hole and uh, not very high. Um, there's a little bit of turquoise in this one. Mike, do you find if that uh, ironwood is a little harder to turn? No, it seemed about the same. I was expecting it to be tough, but it didn't seem like it was um, that different from any other wood, tell you the truth. Now I had a little, it was old. It was an old, it was a tree that had fallen in his, in my, uh, my friend's uh, um, property and it was laying on the ground for a couple of years. So maybe it had uh, spalted a little bit or softened for that reason. Can't really say. This one is Weeping Willow. I don't know if you remember Pete Wade um, about a year ago or more, I guess probably two years, it was before the uh, pandemic. Um, he had he found a, uh, a woman who had a big tree that was cut down by the power company. And um, he arranged that any of us, any wood club member could go, go to their property and get some wood. This is a piece that I got from, from that. The willow is kind of fascinating. This specific piece is pretty big. It's 11 inch diameter. Um, it's had spalted, you could, and, but the spalting stopped on, on that really abrupt line between the, the, the plain wood on the left and the darker wood on the right. That's, all, that's a, like a, it was like a, a moving front of coming in and then stopping. But anyways, a crack there, uh, the crack between the solid wood and the spalted wood, and I put some turquoise in that, um, mm -hmm in that crack willow is a very unusual wood it's very very stringy boy the inside when i was i mean you could do you could use your advanced or uh, many refined techniques on the outside like shear scraping etc to get a decent uh finish but on the inside it was like a bird's nest it was so uh, you know you can only do scraping 
and um anyways it was kind of bizarre but any and it's extremely light wood it, it's got some nice color but uh it's extremely uh lightweight this even though it's 11 inches diameter and, um it's really really uh light this one is the uh piece that i um i demonstrated a couple of months ago for on hollowing i just Put it in the show and tell here you can see the nice uh figure there this is also from my friend's property in um in medina another big one same thing from top view And this is, uh, these are a couple more of these, uh, what I call them seed pods. I don't know if you've, I've been putting these, uh, my experiments on these in the last couple of show and tells. This one, I tried something new. Most of them, I just turn into a, a, these teardrop shapes uh, and then with a flare at the top. And then I carve the flare into a, different shapes. This one is two, a, these are turned on two axes. Um, I turn most of it on one axis and then I tilt it in the chuck and uh, and I um, get a little bit of a weird shape to them. The one on the, the fat one, I like a lot better. The one on the left is box elder one is, uh, I don't know, it just looks a little bit weird on the, the, the straight, too straight of a line, I think on the, on the second axis, but I kind of like them. They're kind of nifty looking. They're better in person than they are in those photographs. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mike. Bob, you got yeah. a story to tell here. Yeah, this is um, uh, a project that I kind of resurrected out of the archives. Uh, and actually, Reine's comment uh, last month uh, motivated me. Uh, when he said that uh, you can do something and put it into an art show and uh, they don't know what the hell to do with it. So sometimes uh, you get accepted and I ended up getting best of show for this. Uh, and it was a whole, what they call an installation. Um, basically uh, with the evidence that supposedly was collected by Captain Bezouj Fosh of the Da Vinci Code. If you remember Dan Brown's book in 2003 so all of these things were started from scratch and uh the uh there was a robert langdon was the uh retired professor from harvard that was a symbologist and he got hooked up with this sophie lady who was a cryptologist or a cipher decoder and they had quite a series of adventures um now, I'd, I'd like to tell you I turned the box on a lathe and tell you how to do that, but that, that's not the essence of it. Uh, why don't we go to the next picture? And um, The thing that fascinated me in reading the book was uh, the idea of a cryptex, which is kind of a uh, security box. And um, a uh, number of show and tells ago, there was a, um, some pieces that were done in alabaster. So uh, I did the chalice, which is uh, made out of an orange alabaster material. Uh, and the stem and the base to it was ebony. And then um, made the cryptics out of a pink alabaster. Uh, and if it's all right, I'll, I'll diverge and talk a little bit about alabaster because that is a stone uh, that actually the word is used in a whole bunch of different uh, materials and uh, the softest of which becomes gypsum for wallboard. And on the most um, hardness scale, that's a 1.5 to 2. Uh, the gemology or the archaeology quality uh, alabaster like this is on a three, three out of 10 scale. And the next thing up is uh, 
uh, marble, which is maybe about four or five. Uh, so this is soft enough that you can take your fingernail and, and uh, dent the surface. Um, but what was interesting, I, I didn't know much about alabaster when I did this, and so I had to do a lot of research. Uh, and frankly, the whole idea kind of scared the hell out of me, but um, the not having any experience with it. But anyhow, alabaster is calcium carbonate. And uh, gypsum, the softer material, is calcium sulfate. Uh, and marble is calcium carbonate. Uh, and how it's formed is that the limestone gets uh, uh, dissolved uh, from the groundwater and seeps down into cracks in the earth and then precipitates. It's very much the same process that makes stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, whereas marble is taking the, the limestone and under heat and pressure uh, down deep in the earth, it gets crunched together and uh, is what they call metamorphic stone. So it, um, it is of a different quality. And, but the way that the alabaster is formed with the, the recrystallization of the material um, it, it makes it uh, softer. There's no layers to it. There's no veining to it. So in terms of turning it, you know, what the hell has that got to do with anything? But the, when you come down to turning it, there's several consequences. Uh, one of which is that there's no grain. So it's a very nice material to turn. Uh, it's soft enough. You can use all your conventional um, uh, tools and uh, it is dusty. However, when I got into the chemistry, the reason I was talking about that was the calcium materials um, are not necessarily toxic. Uh, many of the other stones, if you put on a lathe and turn or, or manipulate, there's silica in it and so you're subject to silicosis, uh, coal miners lung and serious health consequences. So there's I wouldn't advise doing it without excellent dust collection, uh, but at least is the potential of negative effects on your lungs and other things, there's less of it because it's a calcium material. Uh, the other thing that's nice about alabaster is that it's dimensionally stable so that it doesn't expand and contract. Um, and quite frankly, when I did this, Pre pre prepared for this show and tell, I found that my uh, smaller cryptex was uh, split and so I had to repair it. Um, but as the story goes, uh, there was the, the box that was uh, found in a safe deposit box in uh, a bank in Paris and uh, you had to uh, figure out how to get open to the box and into the interior clues. And so there were several layers. Um, and each, uh, every time you open the box and the crypt, each cryptex, there was a different clue and a different uh, riddle that had to be solved. Uh, the story goes that if you break the cryptex trying to get to the interior clue, which was the final one, that there was a vial of uh, acid or vinegar that would have been broken and then destroyed the clue so you wouldn't have found what you needed to do. Um, when I did the outside cryptex, well, the chalice that you see there is about a foot tall and the cryptex is maybe about 10, inch, 10 inches. Um, so I started out with a chunk of alabaster and used a hacksaw to get it uh, fairly close to round in a cylinder then put it on the lathe. And in terms of uh, safety, uh, I also hung a quarter inch uh, sheet of plexiglass between me and the lathe. So in case the thing flew apart, I wasn't gonna be hit with it. Um, so, uh, after I gained experience, I don't think that was necessary, but um, 
I also used a uh, Novichok, and the other thing about it, which <laughs> dovetails with Mike Nathal's uh, comments earlier, is I use it only in the compression mode, not in the expansion mode, because uh, I don't trust it to split apart. Uh, but I made a cylinder and then used parting tool to divide the sep five separate rings and then uh, put them back into the chuck to face them off smooth and then use the Forstner bit to cut the, the hole through the center and then use the little niches there which um, get uh, oriented to the uh, pipe. The, Large cryptex is a, that uh, one and a half inch copper. The small one that's seven uh, uh, three quarter inch copper. Um, and the smaller cryptex, which all fits within the larger one, is uh, made of ebony. Uh, some of the challenges making the code letters on the outside and lining them up to make whatever. Uh, clues uh, that you uh, have to, to open the device because it's kind of like a safe mechanism. So uh, yeah, if you go to the next film or next picture, um, we just embellished the ends of it with some carving, and that had to do with some of the other symbology in, in the uh, uh, novel uh, with the rose theme, um, both on the star as well as on the other end. So the index, so you could line it up and line up the letters for whatever the code word is. Uh, there were the brass let, uh, arrows on the top and the bottom. So you can reorient the pieces together. And on the ebony cryptex, I put in uh, uh, indexing uh, pieces of brass, again, to line up the letters on either end. You were busy for two or three hours. Yeah, yeah, it was a challenge, I mean, but uh, it was fun. Those, those um, flowers on the end, those are hand carved? Hand carved, yeah. So alabaster is a good good material to, to work with, although it's not readily available. It just so happened my son lived in New York City. And when we visited him, I visited the sculpture store on Southern Manhattan. And they had a whole basement full of different types of alabaster. So at that time, that's where I got mine. Uh, I don't know where you get it now. So that's it. Uh, do you do any do you do any sort of finish on it? Um, no, the alabasters you you know go down the grits and it comes out to a very nice smooth uh, surface. I didn't bother polishing it, although you can wax it or uh, you know probably spray it with lacquer. Uh, but not necessary. Very one, neat. One question, if anybody else has experience with alabaster, my question is how thin can you turn it? Like with the chalice up on the top uh, without having the thing fall apart. Anybody? Be nope. a little... Bob, there's a, guy, there's a guy that shows that some of these big things like the a Baltimore American Craft Council thing that does works all in alabaster. I don't know if you've seen him. I can't remember what his name is, but he he makes he makes uh, lamp shades out of it, and, and it's down to got it. Some of it's down to an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch thick, so it's very translucent. It's beautiful. Yeah, back in the Middle Ages, they used to use sheets of it as windows before they had glass. Uh, so translucency is one of the unique features of it. All right. Okay, thanks, Bob. Rainy. Okay. Whenever I get bored with with vessels, I make lamps and jewelry. 
this is one recent example. This is just a, this is a an old cedar dock post from my place where I spend the summer up in Michigan. And uh, it's northern white cedar. It's probably, it's probably been out in the weather for 20 years. And uh, I've got a bunch of these standing around, so I bored a hole in it and, and started doing some the drawing on it and carved and uh, the dark part is, is burned and then the rest of the parts are uh, are turned on the lathe. I think it's uh, so it's northern white cedar. There's some purple heart in it. Uh, uh, what is it? The mahog mahogany on the base and uh, and the the, the bottom base is uh, ash. This is also a piece of northern white cedar that came from a, a log. Uh, actually, it's a little bit bigger than this, but it's about 14 inches long and about eight inches high. This was turned, if you're not familiar with turning a natural rim like this, this was, you can see the pith of the trunk right through the center. So it, it goes right through the center of this thing. And uh, so the log was mounted on a screw chuck with the, uh, with the pith running perpendicular to the bed of the lathe or to the axis of revolution and then turned. So turned with on a screw chuck to make the base or the, the, the chuck hold. And then uh, the outside was turned on the screw chuck and then flipped around, mounted in the chuck uh, to hollow the inside. And then I think I was looking at Matisse's paper cuts and just decided to, to cheat and copy some of them out of the outside. So those are burned. The, the designs on the outside are, are burned with lots of little dots. Ronnie, nice piece. How did you, you. Deal, how did you deal with the pith? Was that, was that wood fairly dry when you turned it? Yeah, this was pretty dry. Uh, uh, you can see there's a, there's a bit of a crack going towards the pith on the left image, but um no problem of it falling out or anything uh uh i've really a cedar is not a wood that i think turners resort to much uh uh and it's plentiful up where i spend the summer I, you know we're on an island up in lake huron and you know it's all cedar for us so this stuff's all over the place and it's just uh uh it's very very soft turns very easily but it tears quite easily it, you know tears quite easily, but it sands like, 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 I mean, it takes a sanding disc to it and, and it's smooth in no time. So yeah, it's very forgiving in that sense. Uh, I really like working with it. Okay. Yeah, here's some, here's another diversion. These are just little pendants. Once in a while, I'll take some scraps I've got in a box of ebony or whatever. So these are all, uh, well, they're two pieces, two pendants. Uh, they're all turned and then they're textured with a little micro grinder, you know, with a dental burr. And they're just, uh, it's uh, Gabon ebony and, and brown ebony. And the left one has, uh, has uh, I guess we could call these vessels. The, the left one carries a pack of porcupine quills and then the right one is just a bunch of pine needles wrapped with some copper wire. And they're kind of fun to make and they go very quickly. So I've, I've done a lot of jewelry uh, in the last couple of years. Some of it turned, some of it just carved. These are just birch logs. I, it's the other plentiful tree up in the, the north woods, and uh, uh, they're just turned into candle holders. And I think um, uh, the right one is a vase. Uh, so they're just bored. They were just bored out on the lathe. Uh, with a Forstner bit. And actually that's about the only thing that was done on the lathe on these, uh, cause the, the mahogany pieces that top them off and bottom them off or they're actually traced and cut in the bandsaw to conform to the shape of the birch. And I, I threw, if, if Mike Nathal's still there, I, Mike, I threw these in for you cause I was telling you about the, uh, the, the Ikea candle holders, uh, 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 these, uh, what I was talking about is on the left here. They're, they're uh, candle holders that Ikea came out with about a year ago. And uh, they're really neat. They're glass and you can flip them over. On one side, they take a 
standard votive candle. And on the other side, when you flip them over, they have a, an aluminum insert that's, uh, that's um, built into the glass that will hold a, a candlestick. They're, uh, and unfortunately, they like all things that are really nice, they discontinued them recently, so you can't get them anymore. So I still have a drawer full of about 10 of them. And the right one just has a glass liner that, you know, I think I picked up about 15 of these at a dollar store for about a dollar a piece, I think. They're a good source for this stuff. They came as candles, actually, so you just kind of put them in a hot boiling pot of water and melt the candle wax out of them. They make really nice, thick, solid vases. Okay. This is... Uh, this is an ash bowl. Actually, this is one of the first bowls I ever turned. It was sitting in a bin that I was cleaning out. Uh, you know, I think I, I think I made it about 20, 20 some years ago. And uh, it just looked kind of boring. So I pulled it out and said, oh, gee, let's do something. Let's continue the journey 20 years later. Uh, so I burnt the texture on the outside. I just burnt, I returned it. Um, uh, I was able to mount it back onto the lathe. Uh, uh, it had a, it had an expansion uh, chuck hole on the bottom, so I was able to put it back on the lathe. I freshened up the inside, got it nice and round, and then uh, the outside's all just burned with a with a, I, I guess you'd call it a a, a basket weave uh, basket illusion uh, uh, burning tool, burning pen uh, that I get from this guy up in Minnesota who makes them, and uh, so that that texture on the outside is just made with that. They're, they're just burned in there and then and then all the carbons kind of brushed off or loosened up with a brass brush. And then uh, they're painted, it's painted with the uh, um, companies called Modern Masters and they make this metallic paint. Uh, uh, so this is, this is painted then with a primer, with their primer and then a copper particle paint that actually has copper particles in it. And, you can leave it as copper, uh, just as regular copper. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to uh, oxidize it or turn it into a verdigris like this, uh, you basically paint on another uh, a wet coat of the copper paint, and while it's wet, you spray it down with an oxidizing agent. And it's kind of a it's kind of fun to watch because it, it it oxidizes like this from shiny copper to this this verdigris finish in about 15 minutes. You can just watch it happen. And then you can do various things with it after it's done. It, it's kind of powdery, just like copper verdigris is. And you can rub it down a bit. Uh, you can, I, I brush this a little bit with a brass brush and then put a matte finish over it. So it's fun stuff to use. They make it in a, they make it in a copper paint, uh, a bronze paint and a, uh, an iron paint. So you can do three types of oxidation. You can do a blue verdigris oxidation, a, 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 a green verdigris, and then you can oxidize the, the copper, or, I mean the iron, uh, to turn it to rust uh, while it's wet with another oxidizing agent. So, and that's that. Okay, very nice. Anybody comments or anything for Rami? Do you, like mask that one. It, do you mask it off to get the uh, distinct lines like that? You mean to mask it off from the, the ash, you mean? Yeah, yeah. No, not really. I uh, Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, when I paint it with the copper paint or with the primer, I it's just done, it's pretty much done freehand. But I, I like to incise the wood with a burner. I have a nice sharp edge. Um, uh, burning pen that this guy in Minnesota makes uh, that you can incise the wood really nicely, almost like an exacto knife, but it's a burn and it provides a nice border. Uh, so if you use a nice small paintbrush, you can go right along that border and it won't cross the line or, or, or bleed with the grain because you know it stops. It's like a like a dam. Um, and then I, I did I, I I did mask this off with painter's tape uh, to spray on the oxidizing agent because that's done with a spray bottle. So I just masked off the ash, put on the wet copper paint and then, uh, and then spray on a fine mist of the oxidizing agent. Uh, you don't want to get that on the rest of the thing. So yeah, 
partially masked. Interesting. A second life for a 20 year old bull. Yep. Who knows what I'll, well, who knows if I'll be around in another 20 years. <laughs> we'll revisit it. We'll revisit it in a few years and see what else needs to be done. <laughs> All right, do that. Okay, thanks, Ryanie. Tom. Yeah. By the way, Ryanie, we want to thank you for that reference that you gave us to that uh, guy up in Minnesota. Um, I did buy a number of pieces from him uh, in the uh, um, and, and have been playing around with it, really enjoying it. So thank you for that reference. Sure. He makes he makes great uh, uh, burning pens. If you yeah. can get through the conversation. It's, I was it's, about to say, you have to hang up there's on There's some it. entertainment involved in the conversation. <laughs> Uh, this one, I've got a buddy who got into recently got into churning, uh, and he he lives in an area that doesn't have any uh, access to any of the kinds of uh, uh, stores that many of us have. So I thought I would uh, make a tool, and I, I had read something, and I I saw that very recently a variation of this was uh, published. But the um, I had a piece of pear tree, I put it on three axes, uh, which I personally find I really like for handles because uh, there's always an area I can find that's the most comfortable um, and bought some high speed steel and put a tri point on it. And the challenge I know for me had been, uh, and I knew for him would be trying to get those angles the same uh, on the three point. So if you go to the next one, I think I have a, yeah. So I actually epoxied on a uh, hex nut and then use the hex nut as my guide to give him the first point on the high speed steel rod. And I got to say, it came out perfectly. It was extremely easy to, uh, to um, get it perfect. And uh, um, I sent it off to him. So it was just pear, dyed, obviously copper piping. You know, that almost seems like cheating, Tom. Oh, hey, if I can cheat, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> just don't tell my wife I said that. Um, I just knocked off a couple. I was going to a dinner party and knocked off a couple toothpick holders. And I was just surprised. Something that I found people don't have and seem to really, you know, be interested in. And like someone was referring to before, you know, these were just a couple scrap pieces of, of wood hanging around the... Uh, the shop and just threw them together. But this one. Um, All right, I, now you're gonna I, have to explain yourself on this. Yeah, so <laughs> Bob, um, after watching the amount of work you do with the alabaster, you definitely wanna build one of these and I'll tell you why. I had, I had been in a bar, I wanna say a couple of years ago, really nice bar in Chicago and bartender asked what I wanted and I did something I never do. I said, I'll tell you what, I like scotch, I like bourbon, you know, some other things, I don't like sweet. You just make me up something. And that's just not a normal thing for me. And when he came back, he put together a tremendous drink. But at the very end, he took a couple sage leaves, lit them on fire, and held his hand with the burning leaves in the glass to retain some of the smoke. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And by the way, it was just a completely different taste. So I decided I was going to make a smoker, um, one glass for, for a highball. So that's what this is. If, if you think of it kind of like a little bit like a spaceship, the uh, top piece comes off. And I think if you go to the second one, then we can come back to explain this. There we go. So this is looking down on the bottom piece. Uh, there is a uh, stainless steel mesh, which by the way, is actually just a, a uh, you know, for a couple of bucks, you can buy a stainless steel mesh that keeps things from going down your drain. Um, I turned the inside to match that and then had layered below this piece a, um, give me one more picture. I hope it, it shows. I can't remember. There it is. Okay. So I had, I had just laminated two pieces of scrap wood together, um, turned it. The top piece, as you just saw a moment ago, was just uh, turned so that the stainless steel mesh would fit in there. And the bottom, I drilled a number of random holes. I don't remember. Is there one more? Probably is not. 
No, okay, come back for a second then. Go back to the first one. So the idea is you take off the top piece, um, put whatever um, uh, sawdust you want in there or chips. And I had just been turning pear and cherry and apple separately. So I was able to just, you know, finally use my some of my wood chips. Um, that is a small butane torch, but I really think you could use a, uh, a butane uh, cigarette lighter. Um, I light the chips on fire, give them a few minutes, and then slam the top. I put the top on top. And what happens is literally the smoke pours down through those holes you saw a moment ago. And depending on how long you leave it, it can infuse whatever is in there uh, with either a very light smoke or a very heavy. In this picture, I experimented with, uh, with uh, making smoke salt, which I use a lot when barbecuing. And it worked phenomenally. I mean, I just left it on for a long time and then you, you smell it, man. It, this one smells like a campfire when you, uh, when you use it. Um, but for drinks, and I, I tried using it just by throwing in, instead of wood, putting in a few uh, herbs, um, <laughs> like sage, you know, that would dry, lit them on fire, did this, and it added just a hint of, of that smoke, essence of smoke to the drink. Uh, the only thing is when you take the thing off, if you don't send off the alarm, you know, the fire alarm, uh, you just have to blow once into the vessel because the smoke when you first open up that is intense. Um, but it was fun. I mean, I, I know I someplace saw a plan for this and I don't even remember when or how long ago. I couldn't find it. So I just kind of, you know, it was on the wing and uh, it actually worked out very well. It was, it's been a lot of fun. And like I said, I, I now have more smoke salt than I probably need for a while. In the uh, 80s, we called that a bong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, you probably haven't tried it with cannabis, have you? <laughs> was, that, was that a question or a statement? <laughs> but it worked great. I, I was really quite surprised. Um, and my guess is because the, the stainless here doesn't mesh, doesn't get you know really intensely burned, it probably is going to last for quite a while. This is definitely a unique show and tell. I, I thought, you know, after after watch what I knew Mike would have his phenomenal, you know, vessels on and wasn't ready for Bob's. I thought we needed a little humor. <laughs> Next right, month, we'll turn bombs. Yeah, <laughs> that could be the show or turn and learn project. Yeah. <laughs> bombs for Alzheimer's. OK, <laughs> but I do want to say that Tom, uh, in addition to this, Tom holds the club record for most Four. days most days between uh, ordering his CA glue and picking it up. It was actually 385 days. Does that come with any ribbon or anything? <laughs> Nothing. Damn. Applause. Yeah. Yeah. All right, moving on. Nolan. Yeah, I tried as hard as I could. I could not get this on the lay. So uh, actually, I couldn't get to the lay this last month or so. So I threw the pictures in just to prove I am still alive and I am in the workshop occasionally. Uh, this is a cherry steamer trunk that I made for my made for my daughter, sort of on request. She said she'd like to have had a couple sets of the hardware that you see there. And basically it's uh, 36 inches long, about 20 inches wide, 16 high, thereabouts. Uh, seems to weigh a ton. There's a lot of a lot of wood in that three quarter inch uh, thick most of the ways but um anyway i, I did a lot of uh, relearning of skills on this uh, between uh, uh, dovetailing and spline joints and, and uh, paneling and a uh, little bit of everything there's a picture of it open uh, again this is in the shop sitting on my uh, table saw which uh, i used for a while I think I use almost every tool in the, in the basement, except for, uh, well, what didn't I use? I didn't use the radio arm saw. Uh, but other than that, I think I used most tools. And finally, I, I got it upstairs, set in front of the fireplace, 
and yesterday I delivered it to my daughter. So, but uh, it was a project getting me busy, but uh, away from the lay for a while. So hopefully next month I'll turn the lay on and make something round. But hey, this was a relearning uh, project because uh, it'd been a while, it's been up to 15 years since I built furniture. So uh, I had to relearn how to use almost every tool down there. But other than that, um, that's what kept me busy. Very nice. Very nice. I'll turn something next month. Jim Mayer. Is Jim on today? I don't know if I saw him. Where did you find all that brass hardware at? This is an urn that I... Uh, they're actually, I think it was... Last... Back, back to, question? The, to the uh, brass hardware. Is that the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they're actually, I think it was, I can't remember, it was Woodsmith or something, put some kits together a long time ago. And uh, I had picked up several of them. Some of them were, uh, were actually uh, tools, uh, small uh, planes and marking gauges and things like this. Uh -huh. that at some point in time, they had, uh, I think maybe it's Sears or something. I don't know. My daughter picked up several of them and got them for me. And this has been sitting around for a long time. And so I don't know where you get it now, but uh, I try maybe Rockler or someplace. Maybe they have uh, the kits. But uh -huh. it had all the brass and the leather straps and everything. It just uh, didn't have any wood. So yeah. I dug back into cherry I used for furniture and some cherry plywood and like I said, I threw all that and uh, even got back into doing some uh, uh, some wipe on poly and wipe on stains. And, hey, I relearned a lot. Now I've got a request for another one. So <laughs> it may take it may take okay, me a while really to get nice. Yeah, you know, the wife wants one now. Now that I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Years, years ago, I had a catalog. You could buy. They had all that kind of stuff in there. Just I don't know how many pages of all the brass things and all that kind of stuff. But I can't remember what it was. And I, and I don't Valley. know if I can find it. Lee Valley has a lot. Jim Jim Mayer. Okay, this this urn spotted maple, mahogany, and elm. About eleven and a half inches tall, four and a half inches in diameter. I started this last fall and the body split. It didn't split completely, so I sawed it off on the bandsaw, let it sit till it dried out, and then added a piece of mahogany and glued it back together. One of the things I did before gluing it together was to drill holes in each side, figuring I'd save myself some time in hollowing. Well, yes and no, because when I put it on the lathe to hollow it, it was pretty damn bumpy inside. So I don't think I'd try that stunt again. I'd just uh, <clears throat> take a little bit out and then normally hollow it and have smooth surfaces sooner to work with. Let's go to the next slide, please. This one shows the lid that I made. I got so uh, enamored with the hollowing, I got down to about three eighths of an inch wall thickness. And this vessel is much lighter than the previous one. <clears throat> but when I find every time I wanna pick it up, I should have really threaded it. And I haven't gotten into threading yet yet. So let's go to the next one. There you go. That's the bottom. <clears throat> However, here's how I'm going to thread it. Let's go back a moment. Yep. Thank you. Yep. A piece of CPVC pipe coupling. There we go. And a piece of CV CPVC pipe. And they thread real nicely. So these are gonna go on the lathe, turn down so I can make inserts to slip onto the 
tenon of the lid and slip into the hole of the vessel. <clears throat> and then I'll have a threaded top. And the finish is uh, wipe on poly. Any okay. questions? Jim, very nice. I just want to mention one thing. Um, those PVC pipe things that you buy, if you buy the wrong kind, they have tapered, they're tapered threads and they don't work that well. You have to find, make sure you get the kind that are straight. So look for that. Yeah, I was gonna put a uh, caliper around it and see if they're straight, but I only need one or two pipe threads anyway. So uh, yeah, thank you for that tip. And the others might be aware too. All righty. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Rich? Yeah, this is a, a, a bowl that I had started some time ago. We had a, uh, a red oak tree blow down in the woods behind the house uh, some years ago, and, and I thought I'd, I'd hit the jackpot. Uh, so I cut up a whole bunch of it to turn. As it, as it turns out, I'm, I don't really like turning red oak. Um, with, with some trees, some, some woods, you get nice shavings, and, and I kind of find with red oak, I, I get shrapnel. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's not my favorite wood to turn, but I had started this one, a nice natural edge bowl. I had set it aside um, and, and pulled it out uh, recently as I was moving some stuff around to finish. I, left, I liked the edge on it, so I left it a little bit thicker so you could see the, the bark on the edge a little bit more than have it just be a thin line. Um, and put some Watco oil on it to finish it. But I, I like the spalting and the sap wood and, and I like the shape of it. And I just think it came out pretty good. Same bowl. Yep. Yeah, that's kind of nifty. Yep. So that's it. Okay. That uh, wraps us up, I guess. Um, looks like we were up to 35 uh, folks on, and um, I think we had around 36 slides there. So um, I, next week, we'll have the general meeting and uh, demonstration. Uh, same time, 9 o'clock start. Ron will be on. Um, anybody have any questions right now? I'd just like to say on the uh, using uh, pipe threads, if you, if you recap it and run the thread all the way down, I mean further than the die, you can make a machine thread out of it. You actually take the taper out of it. You're, you're going too far and that works great. I do that with brass and it, it's fabulous. Uh, Okay, thanks. Thank you.